Beowulf, the Dover Thrift Edition. Lo, we have heard the glories of the kings of the Spear Danes in days gone by, how the chieftains wrought mighty deeds. Often, shale gaping, rested the mead benches from troops of foes, from many tribes. He made fear fall upon the earls. After he was first found in misery, he received solace for that. He grew up under the heavens, lived in high honor, until each of his neighbors over the whale road must needs obey him and render tribute. That was a good king. Later, a young son was born to him in the court. God sent him for a comfort to the people. He had marked the misery of that earlier time when they suffered long space, lacking a leader. Wherefore, the Lord of life, the ruler of glory, gave him honor in the world. Beowulf, son of Skjold, was renowned in Scandinavian lands. His repute spread far and wide. So shall a young man bring good to pass with splendid gifts in his father's possession, so that when war comes, willing comrades shall stand by him again in his old age. The people follow him. In every tribe a man shall prosper by deeds of love. Then, at the fated hour, Shuld, very brave, passed hence into the Lord's protection. Then did they, his dear comrades, bear him out to the shore of the sea, as he himself had besought them, whilst a friend of the Skildings, loved lord of the land, he held sway long time with a speech. There at the haven stood the ring-proud ship, radiant and ready, the chieftain's vessel, then they laid down upon the loved Lord, the bestower of rings on the bosom of the barge, the famous man by the mast. Many treasures and ornaments were there, brought from afar. I never heard of a sightlier ship adorned with weapons of war and garments of battle, swords and corslets. Many treasures lay on his bosom that were to pass far with him into the power of the flood. No whit less did they furnish him with gifts, with great costly stores, than did those who sent him forth in the beginning, while he was still a child alone over the waves. Further, they set a golden banner high over his head. They let the ocean bear him. They surrendered him to the sea. Sad was their mind, mournful their mood. Men cannot tell for a truth, counselors in hall, heroes under the heavens. Who received that burden? Then Beowulf of the Skeldings, beloved king of the people, was famed among the warriors long time in the strongholds. His father had passed hence, the prince from his home, until noble Healthdane was born to him. Aged and fierce in fight, he ruled the Skeldings graciously while he lived. Four children sprang from him in succession. Herogar, prince of the troops, and Hrothgar, and Halga the good. I heard that Signal was Onelis queen, consort of the war Skelfing. Then good fortune in war was granted to Hrothgar, glory in battle, so that his kinsmen gladly obeyed him, until the younger warriors grew to be a mighty band. It came into his mind that he would order men to make a hall building, a mighty mead dwelling, greater than ever the children of men had ever heard of, and therein that he should part among young and old all which God gave unto him, except the nation and the lives of men. Then I heard far and wide of work laid upon many a tribe throughout this world, the task of adorning the place of assembly. Quickly it came to pass among men that it was perfect, the greatest of hall dwellings, he whose word had wide sway gave it the name of Harawat. He broke not his pledge. He bestowed bracelets and treasure at the banquet. The hall towered up 
lofty and wide gabled, it endured the surges of battle, of hostile fire. The time has not yet come when the feud between son-in-law and father-in-law was fated to flare out after deadly hostility. Then the mighty spirit who dwelt in darkness angrily endured the torment of hearing each day high revel in the hall. There was the sound of the harp, the clear song of the minstrel. He who could tell of men's beginning from olden times spoke of how the Almighty wrought the world. The earth bright in its beauty, which the water encompasses. The victorious one established the brightness of sun and moon for a light to dwellers on the land and adorned the face of the earth with branches and leaves. He also created life of all kinds which move and live. Thus the noble warriors lived in pleasure and plenty until a fiend in hell began to contrive malice. The grim spirit was called Grendel, a famous march-stepper who held the moors, the fen, and the fastness. The hapless creature sojourned for a space in the sea monster's home after the Creator had condemned him. The Eternal Lord avenged the murder on the race of Cain because he slew Abel. He did not rejoice in that fiend. He, the Lord, drove him far from mankind for that crime. Thence sprang all evil spawn, ogres and elves and sea monsters, giants too, who struggled long time against God. He paid them requital for that. He went then, when night fell, to visit the high house to see how the ring Danes had disposed themselves in it after the beer banquet. Then he found therein the band of chieftains slumbering after the feast. They knew not sorrow, the misery of men, aught of misfortune. Straight away he was ready, grim and ravenous, savage and raging, and seized thirty thanes on their couches. Thence he departed homeward again, exulting in booty, to find out his dwelling with his fill of slaughter. Then at dawn, with the breaking of day, the war might of Grendel was made manifest to men. Then, after the feasting aroused lamentation, a loud cry in the morning. The renowned ruler, the prince long famous, sat empty of joy. Strong in might, he suffered, sorrowed for his men when they saw the track of the hateful monster, the evil spirit. That struggle was too hard, too hateful, and lasting. After no longer lapse than one night again, he wrought still more murders, violence, and malice, and mourned not for it. He was too bent on that. Then that man was easy to find, who sought elsewhere for himself a more remote resting place, a bed after the banquet, when the hate of the hall visitant was shown to him, truly declared by a plain token. After that, he kept himself further off, and more securely. He escaped the fiend. Thus one against all prevailed, and pitied himself against right until the peerless house stood unpeopled. That was a weary while. For the space of twelve winters, the friend of the Skeldings bitterly suffered every woe, deep sorrows. Wherefore it came to be known to people, to the children of men, sadly in songs, that Grendel had waged long war with Hrothgar. Many years he bore bitter hatred, violence and malice, an unflagging feud. Peace he would not have with any man of Danish race nor lay aside murderous death, nor consent to be bought off. Nor did any of the counselors make bold to expect fairer conditions from the hands of the slayer, but the monster, the deadly creature, was hostile to warriors young and old. He plotted and planned. Many nights he held the misty moors. Men do not know whither the demons go in their wanderings. Thus the foe of men, the dread lone visitant oftentimes wrought many works of malice, sore injuries. In the dark nights he dwelt in Herowat, the treasure-decked hall. He might not approach the throne, the precious thing, for the fear of the Lord, nor did he know his purpose. That was heavy sorrow, misery of mind for the fiend of the Skeldings. 
Many a mighty one sat often in council. They held debate what was best for the bold-minded men to do against sudden terrors. Sometimes in their temples they vowed sacrifice. They petitioned with prayers that the slayer of souls should succor them for the people's distress. Such was their want, the hope of the heathen. Their thoughts turned to hell. They knew not the Lord, the judge of deeds. They wist not the Lord God. Nor in truth could they praise the protector of the heavens, the ruler of glory. Woe is it for him who must needs send forth his soul in unholiness and fear into the embrace of fire, hope for no solace, suffer no change. Well is it for him who may, after the day of death, seek the Lord and crave shelter in the Father's embrace. Thus the son of Heltane was ever troubled with care, nor could the sage hero sweep aside his sorrows. That struggle was too hard, too hateful and lasting, which fell on the people. Fierce, hostile oppression, greatest of night woes. Hagulax Thane, a valiant man among the Geats, heard of that at home, of the deeds of Grendel. He was the greatest in might among men at that time noble and powerful. He bade a good ship be built for him. He said that he was set on seeking the warlike king, the famous prince over the swan road, since he had need of men. No whit did wise men blame him for the venture, though he was dear to them. They urged on the staunch-minded man. They watched the omens. The valiant man had chosen warriors of the men of the Geats, the boldest he could find. With 14 others, he sought the ship. A man cunning in knowledge of the sea led them to the shore. Time passed on. The ship was on the waves, the boat beneath the cliff. The warriors eagerly embarked. The currents turned the sea against the sand. Men bore bright ornaments, splendid war trappings to the bosom of the ship. The men, the heroes on their willing venture, shoved out the well-timbered ship. The foamy-necked floater, like a bird, went then over the wave-filled sea, sped by the wind, till after due time on the next day the boat with twisted prow had gone so far that the voyagers saw land, the sea cliffs shining, the steep headlands, the broad seascapes. Then the sea was traversed, the journey at an end. The men of the Veders mounted thence quickly to the land. They made fast the ship. The armor rattled the garments of battle. They thanked God that the sea voyage had been easy for them. Then the watchmen of the Skeldings, whose duty it was to guard the sea cliffs, saw from the height bright shields and battle equipment ready for use borne over the gangways. A desire to know who the men were pressed on his thoughts. The thane of Hrothgar went to the shore riding his steed. Mightily he brandished his spear in his hands, spoke forth a question. What warriors are ye clad in corselets, who have come thus bringing the high ship over the way of waters, hither over the floods? Lo, for a time I have been guardian of our coast. I have kept watch by the sea, lest any enemy should make ravage with their sea raiders on the land of the Danes. No shield-bearing warriors have ventured here more openly, nor do ye know at all that ye have the permission of warriors, the consent of kinsmen. I never saw in the world a greater earl than one of your band is, a hero in his harness. He is no mere retainer decked out with weapons, unless his face belies him, his excellent front. Now I must know your race, rather, than ye should go further hence, and be thought spies in the land of the Danes. Now, ye far dwellers, travelers of the sea, hearken to my frank thought. It is best to tell forth quickly whence ye are come. <laughs>